Good evening, everyone. So welcome to this March talk, which will give you an introduction into IT strategy with Wardley Mapping. So before I pass over to Mike, I'm just going to go through some um, house rules, some meeting etiquette for tonight. So could you please make sure you've got your microphone, microphone on mute and switch your video off during the presentations? There will be an opportunity for questions later. So if you want to post them into the, I think we've got the chat tonight. So if you want to post them into the chat and then we'll, we'll go through them later. And at that time, the, um, we'll either read them out or ask people to come on with their, with their um, microphones to ask questions. So please do be aware of the other people in the meeting. Be welcoming and respectful to make sure we're understanding each other's differences and being friendly and patient and be open to all questions and viewpoints and be kind to considerate to others so thank you very much for that okay so we like to try and take some um get an understanding of who we've got in these meetings and what's important to them so there's a questionnaire here for you to to complete so there's a link at the bottom or a qr code for you to scan and it gives an explanation of why we're ca capturing the information and then just some questions for you to answer so i'll just leave that up for a second if anyone's trying to scan it um, so responses are anonymous and we'll use the information to uh, hopefully host better meetings in the future okay so just an advert for our branch website. So if you want to find out more about the branch, you can go on there to find information about who's on the committee, the aims of the committee, the minutes from our AGMs, and also information about upcoming and past events. And we also have a LinkedIn group, um, which is BCS Nottingham and Derby, if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to join that. And that will give, again, updates on um, events that are coming up and other interesting things from, from the branch. Okay, and before we pass on, just a quick advert for next month's webinar, which is on the 19th of April. And it's a joint event with CIISEC. Um, so we've got three speakers that evening talking about the um, events that happened about the IT firm Solar Winds, So it should be really interesting. So it's not advertised yet, but keep an eye on our website and you'll be able to see the link as soon as it is. Okay, so that's it from me. So I shall pass on to Mike now to introduce himself and uh, his talk. Okay, hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, excellent. Okie dokie. Just uh, need to stop you sharing your screen so I can share mine. Okay, can everyone see that? Bev, you can tell me you can see it. If you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Then we'll get it going. Okay. So today I'm going to do a talk called Wardley Mapping and IT Strategy. Um, it's going to be 45 minutes. It's going to be an introduction to Wardley Mapping. Um, I'll show you some examples and at the end there'll be some time for questions. So hopefully this will be a little bit on the short side rather than a little bit on the long side because um, it'd be good to get some questions. The parts of today's talk will be, I'll cover quickly who am I? Uh, I'll cover what is strategy and worldly mapping. I'll cover what's in it for you. Um, I'll also cover when not to use worldly mapping. Um, whenever I learn anything new, uh, one of the first questions I often ask is, when shouldn't I use this? When is this not appropriate? Um, and I'm a little bit wary when people can't answer that question if they think that they're, what they're doing is appropriate all the time for everyone. So... Um, That'd be quite useful. And at the end as well, if you if you can think um, when would not be a good time to use this, um, 
I may well add your, <laughs> add your input to my next talk. Um, I'll then go through a couple of uh, examples, um, starting off as everyone does with making a cup of tea, but also going on to selling an IT service, selling your skills, and then if this is interesting to you, you know, where you can go next to learn more. Okay, so who am I and how did I get here? Um, I studied physics and maths. I then taught myself Windows and Linux, learning in the open. Um, Linux being open source and Linux being learnable if you just want to learn through man pages is actually quite similar to the community around Wardley mapping right now. It's um, You can learn out in the open. People will tell you how to do stuff. None of the stuff I'm talking about today is... Um, it's Creative Commons, CC by SA, um, but none of it's hidden. There's no special knowledge that you, you have to pay anyone for, although you can you know, pay people to learn this and buy books. Um, I've worked in really big organisations, uh, the two universities in Nottingham. Um, you know, again, we're you know, learning out in the open, learning stuff in public. It's been quite important to me. And then I've worked also, the right now, working in a quite a small boutique software company in Reading. So I've seen um, strategy and how it shows up in quite a range of organisations. And largely, I'm interested in being, you know, I'm curious. I like to know how things work. And especially interested in how theory shows up in, in real life. So today, that's what I'll be doing. Be showing how strategy shows up in real life and how you can actually use it to make um, to make decisions. Okay, I'm going to have to define what strategy is, and this is my working definition. Other definitions exist. Um, if you've got any, you could put them in the chat. So if you've got any questions about that, but for me, strategy is about choosing what to do um, when you can't work out the options or you don't have time to work out you know when to know what to do um, strategic decisions often involve the context you're in um, the environment you're in and now the context and the environment change over time um, strategy is also path dependent how you got here matters so if you have options a and b and you do A first and then you do B, you might get a different um, outcome to if you did B first and then A. So that's my working definition of strategy, which I'll be using today. Okay, what is worldly mapping? This is also according to me. Um, Wardly mapping is a technique to visualise and create conversations about strategy. That's what you get out of it. Um, you get a picture and you get the conversations that occur around creating the picture. That's the value. It's, it creates conversations in a, in a really interesting way. Um, its strategy is anchored around user needs. You know, what am I doing this for? And it assumes that you're doing it for someone. There's a user need that you're meeting. Um, it involves how you source the bits you use, uh, you have a user need for. Something called climactic patterns, things that just generally happen uh, over time, usually. And then there's things like gameplay, you know, how to do strategy with, you know, competitive strategy or, you know, strategy when you're working with other people. As I said, it's Creative Commons CC by SA. Um, if you've got an improvement to Wardley mapping, um, it could be taken on board. Um, the arbiter of that is Simon Wardley, who invented Wardley mapping. Um, but yeah, he's open to any and every improvement. Um, it's also an attempt to democratize strategic thinking, making us all think better, which is where Simon rather playfully says he's attempting to destroy the strategic consulting industry because he thinks that um, you know, people can, can be taught to strategize themselves. So they wouldn't require you know, expensive consultants. Um, lastly, it might not be for everyone, um, but I found it quite useful. So hopefully you will too, and you'll leave today wanting to learn more. Okay, so review number one. That was me. 
That was my definition of strategy. My definition of what is worldly mapping. You just know now it's a it's a way of creating a creating a picture and having a conversation. So I'll do an example next. What's in it for you? When not to use it? Some more examples and questions at the end. I can't see chat right now, but if you can type questions into the chat, that would be great. Okay, Simon Wardley um, tweeted this yesterday, so I borrowed it. Um, it's his pictures of creating a map for an imaginary tea shop. So what you do here in this example is, imagine you have a tea shop and your user need is someone who, has, who needs a cup of tea. If you see on the side there, it says doctoring, know your users, who are our users? So there we go. We focus on their user needs. They need a cup of tea. So what we're doing here is vertically building basically a list of what you have to do to provide someone with a cup of tea. So we find we need a source of hot water, a source of water, some tea, a cup, a kettle, and power. This is the basics of a worldly map. You'll notice on the left-hand side, it says value chain, going from visible to invisible. And you can see how we, um, we go about giving someone a cup of tea. And you notice on the doctrine, it says, know the details. If you didn't know how, um, how to make a cup of tea, you would, struggle to, you would struggle to make the map. So what we have there is, here's how we meet a user need. And it's a user need someone's gonna pay for, so they're getting value out of, out of us. So it's an economic, um, it's an economic thing. Next, what we've done, we've taken the same, the same, um, the same value chain, and we put it on a y-axis. This is where what you'll do is you generally won't do this by yourself. You other people in your organisation, and you ask, how do we do? How do we do? How do we make a cup of tea? And then the y-axis says, how do we source the components for making a cup of tea? On the far left, you have. Genesis, you know, you invent a new way of doing something. The next column is custom built. In this example, it appears we custom build a kettle. That might be a problem. In the middle is product and rental. So a cup of tea is a product, but we don't rent our we don't rent our cups. You know, we don't rent the tea, we don't rent the hot water. We buy all those as a commodity. So probably go down to macro and get those or they just you know we just buy the cheapest thing we can get so we can see there that different um different components of what we what we make we can source in different ways um simon has said you know you could just call these columns you know one two three and four but he's given them names that he's that he's found you know works in a lot of examples okay so, in our Mickey Mouse example that, you know, no one's really going to argue about, how do we meet the user needs to make a cup of tea? So we can, we can say things in Genesis. No one has done this before. Um, I've got there an example of, you know, when I was working at the University of Nottingham, um, Queen's Medical Centre had a problem um, getting newborn babies heart heart rates quickly to find out you know whether they were having any problems the unit no one had solved the problem of getting a baby's heart rate you know faster than 15 seconds and you know checking the pulse they invented a hat the babies wear um newborn baby comes out you put a hat on it and immediately you know it's heartbeat it's heart rate that had never been done before so if i go back to our worldly map that would be in genesis on the left hand side um, you can custom build things. You know, you've got parts, you solder them together. Everyone's unique. You know, you've got the bits. When the university made its uh, baby heart rate monitor, they made each individual one um, uniquely. You know, they had to probably hand stitch them, hand put the parts together. The next way to do things, you know, you might buy or rent a product and use it. 
So you know, a software product, you might buy or rent some libraries that you use, or you might buy or rent a service that you use from someone. Other parts of what you sell might be a commodity like water. You know, the internet's now a commodity, power, cloud computing. So what we've got there is we've got strategically, we're a tea shop, we're making a cup of tea. How we source the component parts, you know, matters for the, for the end product that we do. Um, here's an example of my whiteboard with the, the x-axis. Um, and this is, for example, of a, a cafe making, um, making toast and selling coffee. Um, to do things in Genesis, they'd probably you know, invent a new type of coffee or a new type of bread no one had ever seen before. Um, and if they did that for every customer, you know, that's, that's not going to really scale really very well. Um, what, what a kind of custom-built bespoke thing looks like is they might bake and roast yeah, um, roast their own coffee beans, bake their own bread on their own premises. So everyone gets a, gets a thing that they've made by hand. Equally, they could get things from macro. You know, we get our bread from macro. We buy big jars of Nescafe from macro, and then we sell it on. Um, utility in this could be, you know, the council fitted a tap and labelled it coffee. And, you know, we just turn it on and off. We don't know what comes out, but, you know, we just pay a bill for it at the end of the month. Okay. So going back to our tea shop example, if someone were to give you this as a, um, if they're your business partner, I'm going to go in business. We're going to sell tea, and here's how we're going to do it. You could look at that and go, so you're going to build your own kettle. And yeah, yeah, we're going to build our own kettle. Is that a good idea? Can't, isn't it cheaper to just buy one from, you know, the kettle shop? And what you can do is you can have conversations like that about all sorts of things. And the great thing is, is that you're having a conversation, you can point at the map and you say, is that in the right place? Should, shouldn't that be somewhere else? Isn't there a way that can be somewhere else? So what you can quickly get to is discussions about evidence. You're not saying, I think your business idea is terrible. You're actually breaking it down and going, it's not a bad business idea, but this bit here, is this right? So uh, the, simple, the simple technique of creating a map which has your components vertically and how you source your components horizontally is a really good way to um, you know, shake down business proposals and strategy. You know, is this a good idea? Should we do this or should we do something else? As I said, strategies about making decisions in your environment, in your context. And um, maybe in some context, custom building your own kettle, you know, heating your water over a fire is a great idea. Okay, so that was a quick, here's a visual map of something that you know we don't really care about, but it teaches us the basics. Why would you do it? So what you get with the visual map is, as I said, it separates evidence from the inferences that you're making about the evidence. And you can start by talking about evidence, which is the best place to disagree. If you were talking about, I want to set up a coffee shop and someone said, well, that idea is terrible. And so I said, that's brilliant. You should really do that. Oh, it'll never work. Um, it's not a great way to, to have a productive conversation. And um, if anything like me, um, I've been in project kickoff meetings where the first thing people have said is, this just won't work. It'll never work. It's stupid. It's a crazy idea. What mapping allows you to do is to go, well, if it's crazy, let's look how we're doing it. Which bit of this to you? You know, where's the crazy bit and what can we do about it? So that's a really useful thing to do. The next thing you get is a, is a common set of names for what you do. When you break down what you do, you find out that you find out who calls things different things. Um, a cup of tea is quite easy. But if you had to break down a ballpoint pen or a fountain pen, 
what are the pieces of it you might find different people call different parts you know different things the other thing you get to do is you get to name name the user needs you meet um that's quite important because getting back to our getting back to our cup of tea example um or a cup of coffee example there are different um different market segmentation for that kind of need um if you're selling a cup of coffee in a lay-by on the a1 might be perfectly fine to have polystyrene cups and coffee from macro but if you're selling coffee um you know in shoreditch you know you probably want to make sure that you're you know you've got some kind of custom coffee beans and you're hand grinding things because that's what your customers expect so modeling mapping isn't saying that there's a particular right way to do things but it does say that in general um when prices are when price is important things generally move right on a wadzi map because then that's where they get cheaper Another great outcome of wadi mapping is you get to find out how we do things around here. Um, if you've worked in you know, large organisations and large bureaucracies, you can sometimes find that you do things because that's just how they're done. You do things because someone's got a job description that has that part of doing things on it. And it can be quite hard to actually ask, you know, why do we do things like this? Quite often, you know, no one person will know all the answers. But creating a map can show you where you don't know. You don't know what's happening. You don't know why you do things. And it allows you to ask those sorts of questions, um, pointing at something and not someone. So you're creating a visual artifact. You're working on a whiteboard or a piece of paper. And um, coupled with working with evidence, it's one of the best ways to productively disagree and um, communicate and collaborate with people. Okay. So it's just gone 20 past. We've looked at, if you want to build a map, you have to name your user needs and have a think about them. Um, in the worldly mapping, um, ecosystem of doing strategy everything about revolves around your user needs if you don't know your user if you don't know what you need if you don't know them intimately and what you're doing um, go away and find out before you do any of the other things that's that's job number one um, there's at least two elements to this strategy one of which is an internal view one of which is an external view looking internally you break down how you meet you how you meet those user needs look at how you currently source the components um, and then you can think about how when you've worked out how you source the components you can think about how things can and will change and i'll give you a couple of examples of that but really what it does um, because you've mapped you know we are here what you get to find out is what's adjacent and possible from here um, adjacent possible is an idea that comes from complexity science and um, it kind of stands against the big let's plan where we're going to be five years in the future and then let's work out how we get there and instead says what's adjacent and possible here and i'm going to do the next right thing so depending on which, um, if you believe in big five, 10 year plans, or if you believe in um, you know, like a complexity science based approach to doing things and we have to start here and do the right thing. Worldly mapping does allow you to look at where we are now, where should, where should we go next? Okay, next up, before I do some examples, I'm gonna go through when not to use this. I invite you to think about any times you can think of when this is not appropriate. Then at the end, we'll see if we can get a list. Okay. The next slide isn't when not to use worldly mapping, so I'll stay on this one and cover that. Um, when not to use worldly mapping is, well, if you don't know the details, you know, it's not a great idea to use worldly mapping. You, you can't map what you don't know about. Um, also, worldly mapping, 
And that was incredibly quick. It's incredibly quick in the order of an afternoon or a few hours looking at something complex. So if you've got a strategic decision to make and you're the first responder, you know, fireman, ambulance, it's probably, it's, um, it's probably not quick enough for you. Um, there's a guy called Gary Klein who's written a book about how first responders and firemen and people make decisions. That's probably the, the strategic decision-making framework you need for super fast decisions like that. Um, when else not to use wardly mapping? Well, I, I try to think of some professions of, you know, who doesn't need a wardly map? I kind of thought of hairdressers and lawyers. Um, hairdressers, because people will always need their hair cutting, and the way you meet that need is unlikely to change. And lawyers as well, they've been lawyering for years. I don't know how much stuff you need, um, how much change is there. So um, Nazim Taleb's idea of um, Lindy, uh, something is Lindy when it's been around a long time. I think it came from shows on Broadway that if a show on Broadway has been going on, going on for two weeks, it'd probably do two weeks more. If it's been going on for two years, it might do two years more. So that's a case of where your environment doesn't really change. So if my, when I get to my slider, we're not to use Wardley mapping, that might have some more examples, but if you can think of any examples at the end, when not to use this, I'd be really interested. Okay. I'm not sure if this slide's in the wrong place, but you can also look at how worldly mapping affects you, as well as having a product like a cup of tea. Um, you may be a developer or a dev, sec, fin, ops type person, front end, back end person. You're probably on someone else's worldly map. And you probably cost them a lot of money. And they probably not like to spend that money. So you may well be automated. So doing a worldly map of, you know, where do I fit in? in the company that I work for, if you do work for companies, is quite useful. Um, as an example, you know, I, used, I was a, a Linux admin. I could install Linux machines. I could make high availability Linux clusters and things work. Um, and then containers come along. And instead of making high availability stuff, if something goes wrong, you just stop the container and start a new one. So essentially, I'll show an example of skills being automated, but you, know, you can get automated out of a job and what broadly mapping can give you some strategic foresight into, into how that might happen. Okay. So here's an example of um, a user need for a website. And I'm gonna introduce a few things at once here. Um, the calendar says this is 1997 and the user needs a website. And what I've mapped is the components, quite a fairly simple map of the components of that website, being HTML code, a web server, power, a computer science graduate to, to write the code, and some web standards and software. So basically the web standards and software had to be invented. They didn't exist. Tim Berners-Lee comes along, makes some standards. Now we can write some code. Um, but the HTML code and the web server are kind of in bespoke. You, know, you probably have to, 1997, maybe you've compiled your own Linux. Um, and HTML coding, you wouldn't call HTML coding now. But back then, um, you generally, it was something that, you know, people could get quite a lot of money for doing something fairly simple. So that's the kind of strategic, uh, simple strategic worldly map of, the user need of a website in 1997. Next up, we fast forward to 2003. And what we can see is that the things have moved to the right-hand side. What well, used to be handwritten HTML, now written in Dreamweaver. What used to be a web server that we ordered the components and screwed together ourselves, then compiled our own Linux, etc. Well, it's now web hosting. And the skills for our computer science graduate, uh, now web developer, doesn't cost quite as much money. So we can see that over time, the way the same user need for a website might have stayed still, um, 
the way that user need has been met has changed. And then if we fast forward to 2018 when I drew this board, um, Wix and Squarespace were around. So our computer science graduate who um, used to do quite well writing HTML code in 1997, kind of took a bit of a step down and became a web designer in 2003. And now if they've got the same skills, um, they're really not in demand anymore. So you can see there how um, over time, someone's skills have been, um, have been take, moved away. The, the need for their skills has been taken away. And Wardley Mapping gives us a way of drawing this and then saying, you know, here's just how it happens. Things, things move to the right, and then you usually, you can often build new things on top of them. So there's an example of how when you work in IT, it's useful to have a good understanding of the context you're in, the environment you're in, and how your environment changes. Okay, here's my when not to use Wardley mapping slide. Um, okay, so have a think. Well, mapping is fast, yeah, first responders. Um, if you're a hairdresser, lawyer, building inspector, yeah, maybe your environment isn't changing that quickly, you know you legally need to exist. Um, don't ward him out when you don't know the details and you're not the expert. Get those people in the room. And interesting, when not to share a map is a different question. Um, if you ward him out properly, you find out how your company does things. And it will give you a lot of insights for your competitors as to how they can disrupt you. So probably don't map your company and share it on Twitter. Equally, mapping upwards in a hierarchy is, can be quite um, interesting. Um, don't map your boss's job and then show your boss's boss the map. Um, there are ways to have that kind of conversation. But it's probably worth, you know, mapping is, um, you know, shows, your, shows, your, um, shows where you are and show where, shows you know where you can go from here what's adjacent and possible you probably want to keep that kind of thing to yourself so there's some ideas of when not to use this okay how are we looking okay so uh assuming that i don't know how many people sell it software i work for a company that that does sell it software so we have end users people buy uh, people either rent our product or software as a service or they, they buy it and install it on the same the same servers, uh, their own servers. So what you can do is you first ask, what user needs do we meet? Now, this is not the same as what do we make. If you have a, a help site for your software that says, here are all our features and here's what they do, that's what you make. The user needs you meet is, oh, actually, you know, what I need, I need to be able to, I don't know, edit my photographs. I've got a user need to be able to um, store cryptographically signed documents for a long time. I've got a user need to do such and such. So what World Be Mapping does, it takes you away from what are our, what are the components? What's the name of the thing we build to, you know, what's our user need? How you meet that user need? Well, you might use software programming languages, um, virtual machines to run things. You might use um, code libraries, all that kind of thing. And then the question, we've always done it like that. You know, we've always written our code like this. We've always deployed our code like this. We've always sold our code like this. Those sorts of things kind of become obvious. So another, another um, perspective on this is that when a user, you know, buys your software or buy your, buys your thing, buys your, um, your software or your service, your product on their worldly map. They, they, they could potentially um, do in-house whatever they're buying from you. But instead, they choose to buy it as a product. So being aware that they're buying you as a product, automatically they actually think, well, what alternatives do they have? Um, 
if you can if you sell an application that will be um, easier to replicate on SharePoint, is that going to be a problem if all your customers decide to use SharePoint instead of your application? So this is quite a complex map. What's interesting, though, is that there's a lot we can read from this. We can see, for example, that on the left-hand side, to make whatever product this is, we can see that continuous integration on the left-hand side is something that they do custom. And so if you sell, if you, <laughs> sorry, they do custom. So if you can move that continuous integration to product and to the right hand side to to a, a commodity you can do whatever they're doing um, much easier and cheaper and so right now um, github um, and gitlab are innovating in that continuous integration area such that if you're a continuous integration specialist and you're employed to do continuous integration or you make continuous integration widgets it's possible that you know github and gitlab are looking to essentially commodify your um your offerings and what mapping allows you to do is to have that on paper have the evidence and point at it and saying i think we've got a problem here and that's much um it's a much better place to have disagreements with people when you can point at something that has the evidence in front of you than, than trying to do it in a verbal, in a verbal manner. Um, what we see here as well is a you know, fairly complex um, digital product, um, which involves you know, browsers, a CMS system, a content delivery network, storage and compute. And if this was you or if this was your competitor, you could you could see how how they were how they were making the product they made and see what was adjacent and possible for them for what they could do okay so just to re review from there you might be meeting users needs you need to know what those users needs are you would specify them and ideally um, your user might be on a journey so while so you might be selling them um, say a content management system, they're not just reselling your content management system as part of for their offering to their customers. They're probably on a they probably bundle that with lots of other things that they do, products they sell. And knowing about the user journey that your customer's on means that you might be able to, to um, sell other products similar. Oh, you know, so you can re rebrand what you do to meet another need on your user's journey um, your skills might be a product on a user's on a user's journey so um you know, your company might be making something and your skills is um you know installing servers compiling web servers um making sure things don't break and so by mapping and visualization, visualizing what you can do and knowing that what Simon Wardley calls climactic patterns, everything moves right, your skills are probably going to get commoditized. They're probably going to be able to be done cheaper and more effectively, maybe without even any human involvement. So this is where um, things like um, Lambda, if you're a server expert, you know, putting things in the cloud, you don't even need a server with Lambda. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a platform that code as a service, um, but also things like low code. Whereas previously, you might you might have been employed to to um, write code to do something. A low code application might do it for you. Um, as an example, I was employed for a year to write some PHP and MySQL code, which can be done loads better with Google Forms and Google Docs. They just weren't around at the time, but they are now. So my skills would have had to evolve to um, to be able to essentially glue together the components of what comes together to make a to make a user product now however generally when you get new commodities you can build new things on top of them so generally um, you know Amazon builds um, compute and then you use compute 
to make new products and then get new products on top of that and on top of that. Okay, so I very quickly, looking at the time, yeah, very quickly run through you know, what is worldly mapping and what it's useful for. So it's a visualization technique, it's a technique to have conversations about what you do in IT, the products you sell or the skills you sell. Um, if I had more time, I would start looking at what the context specific methods, you know, when to use waterfall, when to use agile, when to use lean. By looking at a map, it's actually, um, if I go back to this map, generally the stuff to the left hand side you would use agile methods for. Things in the middle, um, when you've already got a product, you might be looking at lean methods, how to do what we're doing better. And when you get over to the far side and the commodity stuff, potentially that's where things like Six Sigma come in. You know, how do we do this at massive scale where saving 0.1% can mean you know, millions of pounds. And what mapping also allows us to do is that when people say we should do agile everywhere, you can say, maybe we shouldn't. Equally, maybe you shouldn't do waterfall everywhere or any combination of the two. But if you're going to have that kind of argument, having a visual map where everyone kind of agrees on the evidence on the map of what it is you do and how you do it, it's probably a good place to start. Sorry. That's the end of my... The next thing, if you're interested in learning this, there's something called a strategy cycle where you use what's known as the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide and act. You know, observe, what do I see? Orient, what does that mean? Decide, you know, what are the options from here? And then act, you know, do I have the skills, you know, to do what I need to do? There's, um, Simon Wardley has a whole lot of doctrine. Uh, focusing on user needs is, is doctrine number one. Um, Gameplay comes in. What I haven't um, had time to show today is that you can map your competitors. So you've got how I meet user needs, how my competitors meet user needs. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of games, game gameplay is um, essentially commoditizing what your opponent sells. So in that case, um, if you think about the browser wars and you know, Microsoft start bundling a browser with their operating system. And people who sell browsers or you know, have other browsers realize that um, you know, there's, it's not the same market as it used to be. So what Microsoft were doing there were you know, commoditizing um, you know, what people like Netscape and that were, were, looking to, uh, were looking to sell. And you can also do analysis of strategy with this, you know, big strategy like how IBM or Sun Microsystems or Java do things. Um, there's a great book by Eric Schoen called The Art of Strategy. It's been out about a year where he does break down those quite big strategies where large companies will um, maneuver themselves to try and get in a better, a better position for them and you know, commoditize, usually commoditizing their, their um, competitors' products. That's fascinating, but it's, that's not where I work. But all of this can be done basically by learning out in the open. Um, Twitter's good. There's a great community on Twitter. Um, Medium, there's books. Um, you can learn this simply and easily. This isn't some magic technique that you have to go to business school and get an MBA to learn. Okay, it's 1945. I think I'm finishing bang on time. Okay, so if you want to know more about this, hopefully um, I've given you an idea of, if you've got this sort of problem, here's a tool that might be useful for this and here's what it might look like. Um, Simon Wardley invented Wardley mapping and gave it his name. Um, he's at S Wardley on Twitter. Um, he has great conversations with himself on Twitter where he gets to put across his opinion on things. Um, he's really good to follow. Um, Ben Moser um, at Hired Thought. Because um, Wardley Mapping is um, Creative Commons open source, um, 
people like me, I can do talks on it. I don't have to ask Simon. <laughs> ben runs courses on this. He doesn't have to ask Simon, although he has his blessing. Um, ben Moses has got great um, free and paid for courses. He runs learnwardlymapping.com. Um, I would go there and have a click around. Um, there's a great book by Eric Schoen, as a, The Art of Strategy, as I mentioned. That's about £20, but it has... Um, it has a whole load of deep theory, much, much deeper than I've got into today. There's a, a yearly conference map camp in October. That's a really good time for your um, bang for your book. You get a lot out of a day there. Um, there's a Visual Studio Code plugin to create maps. You can create them with code. Uh, you can, I guess you can put them in GitHub. You may be able to have pull requests on them and things, which is really cool. And that's about my time. So, if anyone's got any questions... Um, I'm not sure I understand. That's my watch. If anyone's got any questions, or any examples of when they might not use Wardley mapping, um, if you can type them in the text, and we've got a bit of time to do that. Let me stop sharing my screen. Hey, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Quite a lot of questions and discussion going on in the chat so i shall pass on to paul now to um to make his way through them and get your responses to them hi mike yes i've just been um, synthesizing the, the, the chat unfortunately we don't have a separate chat sorry question q a panel so um i'll go through them and um if we have time at the end i'll, I'll ask people to raise a hand but there's quite a lot of questions come through so from dalbeer to it it was how do you view tactical approaches in IT compared to strategic approaches? And do you consider three to five year plans as strategies? Oh, I'll answer one of those. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, um, I've worked for lots of organizations that have three to five year plans as strategies. And um, if you're in an environment that doesn't change much, if you're a lawyer or a hairdresser or a building inspector, you know, what you do today um, you'd like to be able to project three or five years in the future and maybe do a similar thing slightly better. Um, but if we think back three or five years in IT, um, things change so quickly um, and unexpectedly. Um, you know, look what happened to Zoom in the last year. Who'd have thought it? <laughs> you know, from nowhere to one of the most important companies there. Um, how do you view tactical approaches in IT I'm not sure. Um, it depends on your definition of tactical approach and strategic approach. So I might pass on that question if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, from Russell Plummer, um, do the maps of real world things become complicated and are there ways of handling this? Oh, right, yeah. Well, yes, recursion. Um, Maps uh, can be recursive. You could. One of the things with mapping is you get to name things. You get to say, what's our user need and how are we naming things? Different people in your organization will be concerned with different, um, different levels. So you can embed maps within maps. Um, they do get very complicated. However, if it's too complicated to draw and point at and have a conversation with it, it's probably too complicated for a... Um, a text only document or a conversation without something to draw and point at. So, yeah, get a bigger whiteboard and um, maps can sit within maps. So, a particular point on a map of how you do something might you might be best breaking that down into another map somewhere else, maybe with some different specialists making it. Um, from I can't, this is not a name that I recognize, EZZRP. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is very interesting. I've previously looked at rich pictures. Is it reasonable to compare these or do they do different things? Oh, do rich pictures as well. Um, so if you draw a rich picture of something, it's a rich picture is, from my understanding, basically a visual metaphor. Um, so you might ask someone to draw a rich picture of what the project looks like and they might draw, you know, a mountain and a stream and, you know, an army and say, you know, we're here. It's, it's impossible. Rich pictures do a different thing. So I think they work at a metaphor level, whereas this works at an evidence. Um, the things on a worldly map are nameable things. Rich pictures are more like to come with metaphors and feelings about things. 
do both. That's my. Um, from Samantha, um, how is this different to a work breakdown structure? Um, I did this talk, and someone said it was. It's, it's my job to do um, to do value streams and work breakdowns, and you're not doing it right. So um, it's much simpler. Your, you know, how you break things down. The point is not getting your map right. The point is getting everyone in the room and having a conversation. So um, you still probably have to do all of this, the technical stuff you do to build your thing and understand all your processes and have all your flow charts. Your map is a high level understanding that gets people talking about the same things, using the same words and disagreeing based on evidence. Um, yeah, so it doesn't replace them. It, it's just, it probably looks at a different problem. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, from Dale Beer, um, can you hone into the map? So with the tea example, to do a warding map against just a kettle and Kate get, just keep going in. Yeah, there's a great um, video online of a student who, it's not a kettle, he made his own toaster. He somehow got some iron ore. He might have used a microwave for that. And then he tried to smelt something and make some copper and then tried to make plastic. So he took the parts of a toaster and he made them all. And I think the toaster lasted about two seconds before it blew up. But that's, a, that's, that's the recursive thing. Yeah, you could map. In fact, if, you, if you're a company, um, if you're a company that makes toasters, yeah, that would, uh, sorry, kettles, that would be your worldly map. And being able to source different components from different places, you know, would be would be what you did. Um, there was another question from Delby. Um, it says, does the worldly map factor in the cost? Um, but Richard, who I don't know had to leave, was already in the chat. He says, you can attribute a cost to each component of the map. Yes, some mappers have added a carbon cost per component, for example. So it's more about a case of and doesn't yeah. really have to factor in the cost. So I did this talk um, two years ago, and I did an example of um, you know actually putting unit costs, so you could work out your unit, you know, putting unit costs on each element, adding them up, and then seeing how you could you know, do things cheaper. Yeah, carbon costs have been done as well. So there's a whole, um, I think the whole track in the Wardley Map Conference this year on um, do-gooding which I think is more collaboration and environmental concerns. So around strategy, there is quite a kind of a macho military element to it. It doesn't have to be like that. You can map um, collaboration and, you know, uh, yeah. And I think you should. And the final question that I saw in the chat is, is there a way, this is Richard, is there a way to abstract stroke decompose maps to show value chains at higher or lower levels of detail? Yeah, again, I think this is the recursive thing. Once you get into the mindset that um, things are fractal, it's the same structure at different layers of recursion. Um, yeah, you, you can get really down to detail, but at some level of detail, you know, you things are a product. You know, you buy a toaster, you don't make one. So there is probably a level when you've you've hit bottom. But of course, you know, you, um, Simon has mapped, you know, the strategies of industries and you know countries. So you could go higher too. Um, there's no more questions in the um, the chat. Um, I did like the comment from Richard. He says, apologies, I have to leave the call as he thanks, Mike. Some great examples. Love the motorway versus Shoreditch coffee one. Isn't it? Because can you just imagine, you know, a hipster at the side of the A1 grinding coffee beans and truckers going, I just want Nescafe. <laughs> I always like that. Um, there's um, five more minutes. Does anyone wish to raise... Um, any more questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to ask something verbally. I've got my eye on the participants list. The choice is yours. But if I don't see anything in the next minute, then I'll say I'll be handing over to Bev. So, mm. and Any examples where um, you wouldn't use Wardley mapping, I would quite enjoy. <laughs> okay. 
Right, so more, and a question is just coming from Dalby. Is there a particular document where the map could go into? It depends what you're mapping. However, um, if you work for a big organisation and someone says, we need to do X, um, it could be well be the front page of that project plan. <laughs> because if you can map, you know, um, what would we need to do? We need to move from, you know, MySQL to... Um, I forget the name, a hosted SQL server, you could map, well, what user need do we do? Where does it fit? Unit cost, you know, how much does MySQL cost us per unit versus the previous one? So, yeah, the front page of uh, any project plans, design docs, um, anywhere where anyone wants to change how you do things around here. We, we did an example based on identity and access management, and um, that putting into the various boxes and we came to the conclusion that most of the stuff was actually fits in the, pr the product space or commodity and the yeah. only thing that actually fitted in bespoke or general or genesis was the actual requirement around it's like a, a user interface to get to it that was custom to the company yeah yeah I see. Um, just one more has come through um from paul what tips do you have to introduce, begin mapping with a set of mapping newbies? Um, do something they don't care about. So map, map tea, coffee, toast, anything like that. If you start mapping someone's job in front of them and you're both introducing mapping and a criticism of their job, they're likely to reject both. So introduce it with something stupid that no one cares about and then go oh and it's a little bit like this and let them go oh my god <laughs> so yeah introduce it with um something stupid and let them have the aha moment that things need to change um yeah it doesn't work very well otherwise <laughs> and yeah be oh, wary oh. be wary if they're your boss or your boss's boss <laughs> <laughs> As we're coming to the end now, um, I just um, want to point out there was, there was some questions about whether this um, presentation and the slides uh, were available afterwards. So yes. it's being recorded. Um, so it will appear on the BCS YouTube channel. And if you go onto the BCS website and look up the talk for Walden Mapping in, I won't say a few days, but in the coming month, there will be a link to the, the video and to the slides. So thank you, Mike. Bev, back to you for closing statements. Okay, I'll do that if I can actually use my mouse to click things. So thank you very much, everybody. So thank you, Mike, again for um, for the talk. Thanks for everyone's attention. And so obviously people have found it really interesting because there's some really good questions and discussions there. Um, so yeah, so once you get the slides, um, you can follow up everything that Mike's said uh, at your own time. And thank you very much again. And hopefully we will we'll see you again soon.